Good morning and welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. And I'm Dave Scott. Good to have you with us all across Oakland County. Thank you for joining us on the Megacast on great radio stations like 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 The Biff, and 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. Tyler Keefe is in our Lakes FM radio studio in West Bloomfield. I'm just sitting in my office in Troy, Michigan, that we have... Uh, Tyler, done the very best we can to doctor it up as a TV studio. I've actually upgraded my Zoom today. I've got a camera person in here. We have real television lights and a real television camera. I hope it doesn't look too professional because, you know, we don't want to go too far with all this. But does it look a little more polished? You know, you're starting to make me look bad a little bit. It looks so good, Dave. <laughs> I'll never make you look bad. So uh, we thank you for joining us wherever you happen to be today. We have a very busy show. We're going to talk education after the governor yesterday. Yesterday. Talked to the state of Michigan in her 11 o'clock press conference yesterday morning about how schools are going to open up. We're going to check in with our good friend Ken Gutman of the Walled Lake School District in just a couple of minutes. Later on this hour, a little surprise, Tyler. I got a hold of Paul Glantz from uh -huh. Imagine wow. Theater in Royal Oak, and he is he is essentially all over the media today. In fact, we're going to get him right after he's live on Fox 2 Detroit, and uh, he's going to open up the Imagine Theater tomorrow for a uh, what's the what's the celebration Juneteenth. tomorrow Juneteenth 13th Juneteenth yes. Juneteenth so he's going to open up his theater for Juneteenth tomorrow even though it is a direct violation of the governor's gubernatorial executive orders we'll talk to Paul about that in a couple of minutes that and a whole lot more on today's edition of the Megacast we thank you very much for joining in Tyler I have a little announcement too can we can we make that and then we'll get on with our guests sure yeah go ahead all right. Uh, all the details have been worked out. We are really excited to uh, invite Ronnie Dahl of Fox 2 Detroit and a local resident and a member of the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission uh, to the Megacast. She's going to join you and I and Erica in these broadcasts, and we really look forward to having her. I mean, she is a, a seasoned television reporter oh, yeah. in the Detroit market, one of the most respected uh, investigative journalists in our marketplace, and, and she's joining us here in the Megacast. I couldn't be more thrilled. It's it's great to have her to have an added element of a respected journalist to join our our team here and to help us do what we do better than we're already doing it, and just to have her insight and her experience so we can better serve our communities. It's gonna be it's gonna be an excellent experience for us and for our audience, Dave. So, uh, did you say to finally have a respected journalist as part of our team? I is said that to what add one, say? not to finally oh, have one. Okay. No, all right. I went, no. All right, all right, all right. Very oh. good. All right. No, it's going to be great to have Ronnie. She'll be here on Tuesday. Tyler, you got things all on your own tomorrow. And just yes. for our listeners, we really appreciate, and viewers, we appreciate everything that you're doing and tuning in and being a part of the broadcast. And, uh, you know, we've been doing this for over 65 days. So we're going to continue to do it and uh, just adding more to uh, what we're trying to offer every day. Uh, we could be more thrilled. So, Ronnie, welcome aboard. And uh, we'll all be together Tuesday back in the Lakes FM studios. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to be able to keep our social distancing in that small little studio, Tyler, but we'll do our very best. We'll have to rock, paper, scissors for who stays in the studio and who goes. And <laughs> That's I'll, I'll, exactly. I'll throw the game for you and Ron. I'll throw it. All right. That is exactly what's going to happen. Joining us now via Zoom is Ken Gutman, superintendent of the Walled Lake Consolidated Schools. Uh, Mr. Gutman, thank you very much for joining us here on the Megacast. Well, it's always a pleasure to join you, respected journalists. Yeah, thank you. thank you, quote unquote, respected <laughs> journalist. Hey, listen, I, I've never claimed to be a respected journalist. I'm just a radio broadcaster who started out as a DJ, ended up somehow becoming a talk radio host, and then having this great opportunity. And um, I didn't, Tyler. You, did, when you were at Michigan State, did you have real journalism training? I wouldn't call I wouldn't call working on a news parody show as journalism training. So no, no, yeah. <laughs> no not well, at all. I have to tell you, <laughs> you two do a great job, and this show oh. has had such a diversity of guests, such a wealth of uh, of opportunity that it's just been really a pleasure to be with you throughout these last several months. And so, in all sincerity, uh, you're doing a great job. 
Well, thanks, Ken. I really appreciate it. And listen, we wouldn't be where we are without uh, participation of of our superintendents and 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 other folks in the community. And you've been just fantastic. You've been with us uh, on several occasions. And uh, now we'll move on from the Mutual Admiration Society, get to the news of the day. And yesterday, the governor took a lot of time before the people of the state of Michigan to talk about the return of education. I assume you are watching bottom line kids will be in school in the fall. Uh, tell us what you gleaned from the governor yesterday. Well, so I don't know that I gleaned that kids will be in school in the fall, although we certainly hope that's the case. We, we believe that that will be allowed, uh, assuming that our, there's no more greater public health risk in the fall, a second wave of coronavirus, that sort of thing. And we do know that the governor has a group working right now on making recommendations by the end of the month as to what we can do to reopen. So. I, I do believe that there's an opportunity for us to reopen in the fall. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're going to err on the side of caution, of course, and put public health first. We don't want to put our students or staff in a situation where they're unsafe in the fall. And we do believe we'll end up offering an option for fully virtual school, uh, should that be allowed. So, you know, that, there, there's a lot still uh, to be determined. We have committees working right now on making recommendations over the next uh, four weeks or so to determine what we believe will be the best options for our students and our parents. All right, Ken Gutman, Walt Lake Schools superintendent joining us today. We appreciate him being here in the megacast. And we heard the same thing from, from Dr. Hill in West Bloomfield when we talked to him a couple of days ago, um, that there was going to be an option for parents and families who feel they're, they'd be better off, they'd be safer with their students exclusively at home. Um, and then, you know, as Pat Watson said, another great superintendent at Bloomfield Hills, he said, Said, hope is not a plan we could put all these plans in place but we don't know what's going to happen with the coronavirus and maybe we can't have anybody in the building maybe we can have a larger group of students in the building than you're anticipating right now but but the plans are all being put in place you're working on it and does the model that west bloomfield put out they're one of the first to, to publicize their plan some students, if they elect to, can stay at home, and, and they're not going to have the full numbers in the school. Some students will be in the schools on some days. Others will be in other days. Is that kind of a model? Is that the kind of thing that you think we're heading towards in, in your district and most districts around the state? I, I really don't want to prejudge what our committees will come up with at this point. I'm going to wait to see. There are two factors to this, Dave. One is see what our committees come up with. We have a robust major committee right now that has health professionals, teachers, educators, administrators, and others on it, all of our stakeholder groups represented to try to create the best solutions for everyone. The second factor though is what can we afford? And we don't need to bemoan the state budget right now unless you want to, nor do we need to bemoan what's happening with public education funding, but I don't want to publish a plan until I know how much money I have. And well. we certainly don't know how much money we have right now some of these hybrid models are more expensive than what we do now when we're looking at historic budget cuts. Well, so, I, let, I don't want to bemoan the state budget, but I think it's um, I think we have to talk about money. And I appreciate you bringing the subject up because you're right. I, it, you know, the plans that we're looking at, they don't cost less. They they cost more. We get that. And ultimately, it comes down to what will the federal government doing? The state can only do so much. State has reduced revenue because of sales tax and other taxes that have not come in. We all know that. And the state has other obligations and responsibilities as well. They can move some dollars around, but they couldn't move enough dollars around given the limited funds they have to solve the problem of education. Now, yesterday in the press conference, the governor alluded to the fact that uh, she, and I don't have her exact words, Tyler, maybe we have a quote you could pull up, but it, it seemed that the governor alluded to the fact that she felt progress was being made in Washington and that we would see support for education here in Michigan from Washington, D.C. I certainly hope that's the case, and I've been led to believe that by our legislators at the federal level. They've been great in responding to me and, and, and really trying to work. Both Haley Stevens and Gary Peters uh, have been great. Uh, in working with us. We hope that's the case, but there are still some things, Dave, that can be done in Michigan. Uh, we would look for some flexibility, for example. Uh, you know, the enrollment counts. If we were to be funded next year at this year's count because of the variability and un unpredictability of next year's enrollment, that would help us financially. 
if we were able to lift limitations on, on our ability to deliver classes virtually, that would help us. Seat time waivers, the, the requirement that there's 75% daily attendance, if they could waive that, that helps us in other ways. Uh, so there are other areas in which the state of Michigan can help us between now and the beginning of next school year. So is there a move to make those adjustments to the rules and guidelines that schools must follow here in the state of Michigan? While we currently are advocating for federal funding, we're also advocating for those and speaking to our legislators, and we're hopeful that something can be done because there's some action that can be done locally across the state of Michigan to help schools, and we're hoping they're able to do that for us. All right. Well, Ken, I, I appreciate it. I know you guys have uh, a very difficult path ahead of you, and we're coming up to the end of the school year. Do you, you have any other thoughts about money for this school year? Is the state going to continue to fund things the way you expected, or uh, are you expecting, do you have any updates for us and, and what uh, you folks in the education world call a proration, which essentially means the state's going to give you less money? We've been given no word whether there will be a proration. We have 12 days to hold our breath. And, uh, you know, hopefully at the end of 12 days, we've not heard from anyone in, in that regard because we've spent our money for the year. Our year is over. The money's gone. How much more can you take? No, I get it. I get it. It's a real challenge. And, and you got next year to deal with and, 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 and this year to clean up. And this is all falling right in the middle of all that. Ken Gutman is the superintendent of schools of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Ken, I didn't get a chance to do much prep today uh, or talk to you extensively before we went on the air. Were you in that, uh, in that, that education um, uh, what was it yesterday? Uh, open house education, uh, town hall is what they called it. Did you participate in that yesterday? I did not. Unfortunately, I was tied up in meetings all day. I was not a part of it. Hey, that. Tyler, why don't you pop in uh, here for a minute? Yes. Can you just give us a summary of what was said in the education town hall yesterday and just give Ken and I some kind of feedback? There was a education town hall with a number of superintendents from around Oakland County. What was the what was the main conversation? Uh, they, they talked about a number of different issues. So Representative Brenda Carter's office uh, originally they were going to have different state and uh federal leadership involved in the town hall, but uh, state and federal leaders got called into session. So uh, it was really a QA and a and a discussion between Pontiac superintendent, Wald Lake, Super, sorry, not Wald Lake, uh, West Bloomfield superintendent and uh, Avondale schools, the superintendent about a number of different issues that included programs for kids who may be not, who may not be able to be in school and have to learn virtually entirely. Dr. Hill talked about plans for a hybrid program to give some options. Um, Pontiac Schools talked about partnering with community organizations for those families whose kids are going to have to maybe learn virtually in, in the fall on days when they're not in school, but their parents are going to be back in work. And they also talked about partnership between Oakland County Schools and uh, Oakland Schools and these various different school districts uh, to provide things like nursing and help with other programs to help support these students in an unknown, but also kind of a known unknown of a virtual in-person hybrid or one or the other that may be the case come fall. So with that, Ken Gutman, uh, are there things that Oakland schools can do to coordinate between the districts to uh, maybe offer some combined services or reduce costs? We're really grateful to Oakland schools. Thanks, good question, Dave. I know you had Wanda, Dr. Wanda Cook Robinson on the show recently. Uh, Wanda is a fantastic leader. I've had the honor of working with her for about a, probably 15 years now in different capacities. And she's worked with our, our executives at Oakland County to bring us school nurses. And so uh, it, it, they're not, it's not a permanent position, but it's a start. And to have school nurses across Oakland County at a time of a, of a, of a global pandemic is particularly helpful. So that is one area in which we're really grateful for the partnership with Oakland Schools. You know, I, I started hearing a, about what, uh, what's going on around us. And I think, you know, this is, this is one of the biggest challenges we've faced in our, in our careers, in our lifetimes. And at the same time, I think, what a great opportunity. If, if we're going to rethink how we deliver education, this is the time to be innovative. This is the time to be creative. This has given us a chance to make things happen that, previously may not have had the same impetus behind it. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, this has been a headache, a challenge, a financial drain, and and it's almost taken our country down economically. 
Meanwhile, America and the people right here in Oakland County, I'm so proud of everybody. Uh, we've all stood tall. We put on our masks. We've washed our hands. We've helped. Parents have helped their students cope with being at home and try to learn in a new way. And you're right, Ken Gutman. We have an opportunity now to find new ways to help teach students here in our country and you know we've been sitting at desks with paper and pencil and books and i know we have computers now but we've been doing that for for a, a couple of centuries right so wholesale change of education is here whether we want it or not it's here and i i expect a lot of things are going to start to come up you know we've talked i remember having a conversation with my parents when i was a kid back in the 70s when I was going to high school. And, we, you know, none of us really understood why school closed in the summer. I, I was going to Westmoreville High School. It was an air-conditioned building. I didn't have to work in agriculture in the summer. Many of us in, in, in Michigan, some do still, but a lot of us don't. Does is, is even uh, That is an example. Uh, uh, but we have some things that some traditions that may be outdated that we can update now because we have to, Ken Gutman. 100% agree. And what I don't want to do is start a panic in Wild Lake by throwing some ideas out there. And then, it's, uh, <laughs> well, Wild Lake's going to year round schools or Wild Lake's going to offer evening classes. That's not the plan right now, just to be clear. But why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we talking about, you know, like with, with this virtual option? First of all, we know parents can't return to work until students are back in school. So that's an obstacle to overcome. But looking forward over the next several years, why are we not offering evening opportunities for classes, particularly with high school students? Why aren't we looking at our start times? Why aren't we looking at, at, at some year round or some balanced calendar types of things? And, and a lot of us have looked at them, we've discussed them. There hasn't been a lot of momentum behind them because people are entrenched in the traditional. That's not the way we always did it. And it's time that we had that we were able to rethink that. And this has given us the opportunity to do so. All right, Ken. Well, thanks for your time today. The school districts, I, I, I enjoy talking to the superintendents because you guys are at the intersection of, of food uh, and other community services, of educating our, our kids, of being the center point for uh, so much interaction with the community um, that it, you're just right in the middle of it. You've done a great job uh, taking care of things. And, and, you know, and then I see school districts that are continuing to feed people during the summer. I mean, it's, it's just amazing what's been going on. So great job, Ken, by the way, uh, graduation, what's the update on that? Well, we do have some dates reserved July 31st and August 2nd at Eastern Michigan university in the convocation center. We're still hopeful that can happen, although we need to make a decision soon. So parents can either keep the dates on their calendar or not. But last Sunday, we had three incredible senior honor ceremonies. They drove into one of our facilities. We had large screens and a stage. Parents and students decorated their cars, students in caps and gowns. It was an emotionally draining, positive event. I love what our community did. They turned out and we celebrated the achievements of our accomplishments of our seniors. Uh, I'm so sorry I was not there. I was unavailable on Sunday, but uh, I'm really glad to hear that. And if you have anyone you or judy have any video we'd love it if you'd send it along and we'll we'll uh, post it on our website and uh, congratulations to all the graduating seniors in Wald lake and across our entire listening area ken anything you want to add before we say so long i just continue to be so proud of the Wald lake schools community the staff the parents the administrators community members who stepped up to take care of children the very best they could during very challenging times and it's just an honor to be of service to the community Superintendent Ken Gutman of the Walled Lake Schools, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Dave Scott. Tyler Keefe is here. We're on great radio stations and municipal television. It's 89.3 Lakes FM in West Bloomfield and beyond. 88.1 The Biff in Bloomfield Hills. 89.5 Avondale Community Radio, serving a big chunk of Macomb and Oakland County. Thank you for watching on Birmingham Municipal access on channel 15 comcast and of course civic center tv on channel 15 comcast you can find us also on the at t cable on channel 99 go in and hit one of your favorite communities likely our video will be there we also invite you to watch civic center tv 
Facebook.com, our website. You can see our live streaming video there. And then also uh, look at our archives in the past several months. Every interview we've ever done is posted there, along with very helpful information from all of your regional, local, and national uh, governmental entities. And, uh, and of course, you're going to find the stories, the top coronavirus stories of the day. Well, yesterday when the governor was talking, we got a pretty favorable report, and we've been seeing it in other general media reports. Uh, the current status of the coronavirus in Michigan is doing really better than most. When we return, we're going to talk to Dwayne Baxa, Associate Professor, Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine, and get the latest medical information on the coronavirus. When we return, this is the Megacast. Coronavirus has put us to the test. Now it's time to put it to the test. We've greatly expanded testing in Michigan. So people who think they may have COVID-19 with symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath can get tested. And those without symptoms who work in public can now get tested because they could carry the virus. Start by calling your healthcare provider or contacting a testing site near you. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Hello, I'm Dr. Betty Chu, Chief Quality Officer at Henry Ford Health System. And I'm with Wright Lassiter, Henry Ford Health System's CEO, to talk about coronavirus. In uncertain times, it's natural to have questions. So I'm going to ask Dr. Chu to answer some of the common ones. First, why can't I visit my grandma to see if she's okay? Because the elderly are at a higher risk for complications with this disease, and you could inadvertently infect her. If I'm healthy, why can't I go out with my friends? The larger the crowd you're exposed to, the higher the chance you could get infected and infect others. If I have symptoms, why do I have to seek care? While the disease isn't dangerous for most people, for others it can be. We need to understand how serious your case is, because the right choices save lives. For more information, visit henryford.com or call 313-874-1055. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. And I'm Dave Scott. Good to have you with us here on Civic Center TV, on Birmingham Area Municipal Television, on our great radio stations, and live on the Internet. And a big thanks to the Walnut Lake Consolidated Schools, who has us broadcast on their Facebook uh, live channel. We always appreciate being with Walnut Lake. It was good to have Ken Gutman with us. Let's uh, shift and, and talk issues medical-related to COVID-19. Joining us now is Dwayne Baxa. He is the Associate Professor, Oakland University, William Bowen. Beaumont School of Medicine. Uh, Dwayne, thank you very much for joining us here on the Megacast. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, good to have you with us. So I apologize. Um, I, my script for the show today does not have a doctor in front of it. Are, are you Dr. Baxa? I am a PhD, yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Not so, a physician, but a PhD. <laughs> right, so I don't, do I call you Dr. Baxa? Do I call you Professor Baxa? Do I call you Dwayne? What do we Dwayne call you? Dwayne is fine. I, I, I answered anything. <laughs> So, All right. Very good. So um, we've we've really appreciated uh, the contact that we've had with a lot of the professors at Oakland University. Let's talk COVID-19 from the medical side, if you will. Um, what are your thoughts as to where Michigan is right now? And uh, I don't know if you saw the governor's press conference yesterday, but, you know, she we have not all loved the things that she has done. I mean, she said, well, you can power boat, but you can't sail. You can golf, but you can't take a cart. And I can go on and on. But at the same time, Michigan is in about the best spot of any state in the country. Your thoughts? Well, I, I agree. I think we are in one of the best state, uh, spaces of, for the country. Um, obviously, these things have been a major inconvenience to us, uh, but they are essential, right? Because we deal with uh, population that's susceptible, and we are concerned that those individuals are going to become infected and join the infected population. And right now, we, you know, the concept of herd immunity 
uh, is that the individuals would become ill or be vaccinated. And we just don't have the numbers of uh, those individuals that have survived the infection to, to basically say that we can return to normal in terms of our so associations with each other. So I, I think though that we've, we've had these inconveniences, I do think that they have made a major impact in, in preventing the spread and managing those people that are infected so that they can get the best care from our hospital system. Well, Professor, Professor Baxter, you should know, you worked in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit as a technical director of the Infectious Disease Research Laboratory. COVID-19 is still out there, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, and what do you make of the states that have been having problems, that we are seeing new peaks? What, what, what can you glean from that? Well, we know that this is a possibility as we start to release some of the restrictions that we've seen. Um, the, the question is, is whether or not these, these communities are doing this in an all-out uh, procedure or if they're doing it phased. And actually, the, the way that Michigan's approaching this, I think, is, is wise in terms of phasing things in uh, over time where we can get information as well as continue to do testing and uh, contact tracing, find out which individuals are infected and those people that they associate with. In combination with those things, we will be able to determine you know, whether or not certain interventions are more effective than others and whether or not there are certain things that we need to maybe revisit in terms of uh, future spread. Well, Duane, obviously, we'd all be better if we just stayed at home and locked ourselves in our homes. But, you know, it's just not practical economically. I think everyone would agree that that we just can't go back to isolating ourselves entirely. But you look at the things that we've done. First of all, hospitals are in much better shape. They that we, we know how to treat. We've learned how to treat. We have hospital beds now. And even if we were to have another peak we have the ppe we have the ventilators we have the other things to be able to better uh, treat people and deal with another peak if we get it but i think maybe one of the biggest things we've learned with all that is as individuals we definitely know the things we can do to uh make this better not only for ourselves but for the community starting with wearing masks Certainly, certainly. And, and washing hands. That's one of the basic things that you can do for any infection is to, for, to prevent the spread is by washing your hands appropriately. So I think these, these things, we've seen uh, the governor touted one model in particular that showed that Michigan has done an excellent job of, of reducing the number of infections and that those uh, limits on mobility have had an impact. Uh, the thing is, is that there are other interventions as well. And in combination, these things are making a great impact. So as we reduce restrictions or release restrictions, we need to continue still wearing masks, doing social distancing, washing hands and so forth, at least for the foreseeable future until we do have some uh, vaccination uh, opportunities in the future. Uh, the thing is, is that we could quite easily, if we give up and, and, and say we're tired of doing these things, we could quite easily go back and have these spikes, as you mentioned, these peaks. And even though we are in a good situation to handle them right now, we could also easily overwhelm the hospital systems because there are only so many beds available for those with severe infection. Dwayne Baxa, he is the Associate Professor, Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine, and has got a very impressive infectious disease re resume. We appreciate you joining us. So hey, what do you think? I mean, do you think that if we start to see numbers increase here in Michigan, that we're going to have to lock back down, that the governor's going to say stay-at-home order is back in place, or can we utilize the things that we know? And, and maybe there's no answer to this, but I like your opinion. Can we utilize the things we know, the masks, the hand washing, uh, the social distancing, the other things that we've learned to mitigate this enough to keep our society running at least some at, at least some reasonable level? Yes, I think that's entirely doable. I mean, obviously, in an extreme situation, we would have to go back to more restrictive measures. But the thing is, is these policies work because the population is making them work. The residents of Michigan have done... Uh, followed the recommendations, and, and they have been the ones that have resulted in, in these lower infections. And even as things start opening up, as we visit our restaurants, as we, as we go and, and visit family that we haven't been able to see for several months, we still have these restrictions in place, these self-behaviors, hopefully, that have been modified that will ease the risk, right? There's always a risk, and the question is managing that risk. And whether or not you do multiple things that increase the risk, 
or try and mitigate those as much as possible. But yes, you're right. I mean, we, this is not sustainable economically for us to be in a lockdown forever. So we do have to have some resemblance of normalcy, but that norm, normal normalcy is going to be different than it was before. Dwayne, this has been a pain, and no one is really happy with the governor uh, because it, this has impacted all of us. I mean, we're we're going to talk to Paul Glanz in a couple of minutes, and he's opening his Imagine Movie Theater uh, for a very good reason on Friday, but against the governor's wishes. So this has been hard every step of the way, and I think this thing I've said has been harder for her to untangle than it was to tangle it in the first place. That all said, you look at where we're at right now, and it's really hard to to draw any other conclusion than the governor has saved lives. I, I would agree, right? And and there's historical precedents for this too, from the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, where we've seen communities that acted early on uh, saved lives in the long term, right? And the idea is to, as you've heard, flattening the curve. The idea is to to try and reduce the number of infections so that our systems can handle the the burden until you know there's interventions that are available for treatment and, and vaccine protection and in the interest of uh, of of being fair and unbiased because we don't take sides here we're we're a community broadcaster so we don't do sure. that but in the interest of being fair we we could also say that the governor's decisions with regard to putting COVID 19 patients back in nursing homes here in michigan that didn't work out so well that it didn't and and the thing is is that there are decisions to be made. They're made uh, with the information that's at hand. And as you had mentioned earlier, as we pr go through this process, we are learning things new all the time. We are learning how many people are truly infected. We are learning in terms of why some individuals are asymptomatic versus others that have severe infection. We are learning what therapies can work and which ones don't work. All of these things are changing the, the relative infectivity for a particular population. And as we've heard, our numbers have come down in terms of one individual infecting the next. Um, so anything that can do to mitigate those are going to be helpful. And we do that, we learn that over time. So we are going to make mistakes, particularly when we're trying to rush to, to, uh, to try and make plans to, to mitigate these situations. But, you know, we learn as we go along. Dwayne Bax, Associate Professor, Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine. Uh, professor, I assume you're in the business of teaching young minds what's going on in the world. Uh, are you going to create some COVID-19 curricula? Actually, we have. Uh, we, we did a, a relatively short course. It was a two-week course for our M3 and M4 students uh, where they did a self-directed uh, activity creating resources actually for their peers in the medical school community, as well as uh, residents and physicians to provide resource information. So uh, we did that as a course, and then the students were able to produce a product that then can be shared with other individuals, giving them information about how to manage, particularly from the student's viewpoint, because they are going to be in the hospital in their clerkships, as well as those that are graduating are going to be in the residencies, and they need to learn how to function within this new environment. Well, and, you know, it's a traditional role of universities to um, take a look, educate kids, research, and provide information back to the community. Clearly, at Oakland University, you've been a big participant of that, along with our other major educational institutions here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, you know, we at Oakland University, too, have a, a sense of community serving our community. So a lot of our projects, um, particularly from the medical school side of things, are community-based. We we uh, evaluate programs uh, for individuals in terms of health disparities, um, access to care, things like that, medical literacy education. Uh, our projects cover quite a, a distance of things. And I'm actually one of the co-directors of our Required Embark program, which is a scholarly concentration program. All of our medical students are required to do research uh, over their four years of medical school training. And this program allows them the opportunity to not only uh, understand the concepts of research, but also be good consumers of research information, because certainly not all research information is necessarily going to translate into clinical decision making right away. So they need to know when it is appropriate to apply that information and how to be critical of the information they do receive. Not only that, they need to be good communicators to the public and translate to their patients what these things see, because particularly in this era of, of uh, internet news and so forth, you know, people get information and, and they're not sure whether or not this is good information or bad information. And that is one of the jobs of our healthcare professionals is to translate that information to our patients. 
It's and it's every citizen. I'm so glad you brought that up. In, in this society, it's every citizen's job to to take what you see from the media, the internet, a post on and uh, on Twitter, and just take all that stuff. And you gotta assess that as an intelligent American and and process that against all the rest of the information. Unfortunately, we don't have Walter Cronkite around at the end of the day to. <laughs> put it all in a nice little 30 minute bundle for us it's a different time we have a lot more information but you know with more information you, you can get a little bit more garbage too so people yeah, do a pretty good job of the rush to get information right? <laughs> yeah. in this, we see in this situation with covid everybody wants to know what's going on and then you see some individuals in the in the public sector that are, are frustrated because today we hear this and tomorrow all of a sudden it's different and the reason is is because we're trying to get the information out there to be utilized quickly but at the same time, as we learn something new, that may change things. So this is a very dynamic situation, and we need to keep that in mind as a, as a population, as a community that's trying to work through this. Now, there's two sides to that. I mean, more information, and, and, and that can be good, but you just have to measure that information that you're getting. Uh, do, do, do young people want to be doctors now? Is all this and the danger that doctors have faced over the past couple of months, is that encouraging young people to get into the medical profession? Or do you think it's got some people scratching their heads saying, May, uh, maybe I, I want to be a lawyer? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that does happen too, right? <laughs> yeah. But I believe it does to some extent. I mean, our, our students are, are vetted in their admissions, and many of them have been motivated either through personal experiences or interest in the, in the field to become physicians. And they're very interested, particularly at Oakland University, of becoming compassionate physicians. It's something that we very much focus on. Uh, so I think that is what motivates our students. And, and even though these are difficult times and concerning times for medical health professionals, um, I think it, it drives them probably even more so to, uh, to try and help our community. Wayne Bax, assistant producer, or assistant professor, rather, Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine. Thank you very much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Before we say so long, you're an infectious disease expert. You know a heck of a lot more than, than we do here. Uh, a vaccine. What do you see in your crystal ball with regard to a vaccine? Uh, from what I understand from the literature that's out there, a vaccine is probable. Um, this virus is capable of infecting us, and we generate a relatively strong immune response to it, and it seems relatively durable. So that's good news for vaccine development. Um, and I believe that, you know, from what I understand, there are uh, several vaccines that are in the, on the horizon. Of course, we have to get through the, the trials phases where we determine safety and efficacy, and sometimes those don't pan out. Uh, when we get to the research end of things, but in development and so forth. And that's why, you know, it takes a certain amount of time for us to develop a vaccine that we feel is safe and effective to, to release. And, and, and well, what's, what's been interesting in this cycle and the interest of trying to uh, accelerate that process is uh, there's been uh, support to begin manufacturing, even if the the vaccine doesn't play out and then all of that manufactured product goes to by the wayside but in an if in an effort to get this in front of people as quickly as possible um you know the the ramp up of the manufacturing can take so long that is one way to shorten the curve let's start manufacturing even if we don't know if we're going to ever be able to put this product out in the marketplace and i assume that is what's going on that is something they are considering. And we even, uh, you know, there's some aspects of that to even the yearly flu vaccine, right? Because if people aren't utilizing the vaccine, aren't getting vaccinated, that there's a certain amount of production that's made and then that goes to waste because people aren't utilizing it. So if people don't get vaccinated willingly, um, you also have a production problem where you have a lot of vaccine on hand, but then it goes to waste. So there are considerations with that, obviously economically in terms of research and development for the companies that produce these. So there are a lot of aspects that are complicated. <laughs> All right, Dwayne, thank you very much for being with us. I really appreciate it. Dwayne Bax, uh, assistant professor, Oakland University, William Beaumont School of Medicine, and uh, knows an awful lot about infectious disease. We'll keep you in our in our Rolodex. We still have an old Rolodex. We'll keep you, we'll keep you in there and, and uh, probably check in with you again soon. Thank you. Hey, thank you very sounds much. Sounds good. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, very good to be with Take you. Take care. Stay safe. And I'm going to go wash my hands. we got to get my mask. My mask is right here. I got it. As soon as I get off the air, I'm alone in, in this studio. We, uh, we're doing all we can, and I know 
the folks watching and listening are doing the same. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. You are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. What? What? What the heck is a megacast? It's three great radio. It's one, two, three. Three great radio stations, 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 The Biff in Bloomfield Hills, and 89.5 Avondale Community Radio, not too far from the campus of Oakland University. It's also Birmingham Area Municipal Access, Channel 15 Comcast, Civic Center TV, also Channel 15 Comcast in West Bloomfield, and on cable, and Channel 99, 18 t Go into the governmental areas, and you'll find us in a lot of those outlets. You can also tune in at civiccentertv.com. And today, thanks to the Walt Lake Schools, we are on their Facebook Live. Tyler and I will be back in a moment. Don't go away. It's the Megacast. Coronavirus has put us to the test. Now it's time to put it to the test. We've greatly expanded testing in Michigan. So people who think they may have COVID-19 with symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath can get tested. And those without symptoms who work in public can now get tested, as they could carry the virus. Start by calling your health care provider or contacting a testing site near you. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We know that we're asking Americans to do a lot right now. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible to this virus. A question I often get asked is why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. Social distancing is really physical separation of people. It's what we refer to when we ask people to stay at least six feet apart. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants, not going to theaters where there are a lot of people. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others who might actually be infected or infect you. We all have a role to play in preventing person-to-person -person spread of this disease, which can be deadly for vulnerable groups. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith. And I'm Dave Scott. Tyler Keith in our Lakes FM studios in West Bloomfield. I'm at our studios in Troy. Actually, this studio is my office, to be honest. In the Zoom world, you can be anywhere you want, right? Uh, thank you very much for joining us on Lakes FM in West Bloomfield, on the Biff in Bloomfield Hills, on Avondale Community Radio in Oakland, and uh, also Macomb County, and on our wonderful municipal television stations all across the county. Good to have you with us. Thank you for being here today. Hey, Tyler, in a couple of minutes, we're going to talk to a company that has found a way for us to use our hands a little bit less for an activity we do each and every day and that's opening doors and when you think about you know just it, i don't even want to really start people thinking about all the germs that are on doorknobs because tyler i open oh, so many doors every day uh you know it's probably one of the most universal places a doorknob where all of our hands are on and we just you know we do it without even thinking about it it is, and it's one of those reasons why Dr. Jamie Tawil, a good friend from the show here, has, has been suggesting that we use our non-dominant hand to open those doors because we're doing it so often, and it's a, it's a thinkless act that we do all day, every day, and that's a lot of germs, as you said, that are on those surfaces. So any way we can do that in a cleaner way or do that less, it's going to be effective, especially during the pandemic. Well, a local entrepreneur right here in our area has come up with a solution, and we're going to talk to him in a couple of minutes. But right now, we are delighted to be joined by the, uh, I think, the, the owner, president, CEO, we'll get the title right, of Imagine Theaters, and it's Paul Glantz. Paul, thank you very much for joining us on the show. My pleasure, Dave. Glad to be with you. What's your title? Let me get your title. What's it, what's it say in your business card? Well, co-founder and chairman these days. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. So we've been reading the news. I know you've been all over the media. You were on television a couple of minutes ago before you, you joined us. You've decided to open up your theater tomorrow. Tell us a story. You know, we uh, have a timely opportunity to, to do something we think is really useful in, in its uh, community which is not just an issue of press release supporting our African-American brothers and sisters, but to actually do something meaningful 
and use our venue to raise money for a worthy cause. And so we came upon the idea of doing the Juneteenth Film Festival, kicking off tomorrow. It'll be hosted in Madison Royal Oak. We'll be hosting uh, films from critically acclaimed actors, directors, uh, all of uh, African-American descent. And we'll be raising money for our terrific cause, which is UNCF. And so I would tell you that uh, this is really just about uh, our effort to do good and to speak with our actions more than our words. Paul, I know you are one of Metro Detroit's most charitable entrepreneurs, and uh, anyone who knows anything about you knows that's absolutely the case. We see you at, at, at uh, you know, all kind. We see you um, doing your part all over our community. Um, this one is a little bit interesting in that the governor has closed down theaters here in the state of Michigan, and, and she's not opened them, and, and you decided to proceed with this event in spite of that. Uh, just can you take us through your thinking on that? Yeah, here's the thought, Dave. We have uh, voluntarily uh, complied with and, and uh, decided to close our doors for the last three months in an effort to support the governor's uh, undertaking to protect public health and safety. And so we're supporters. Concurrently, we're now at a point where it's reasonably clear that there is no reasonable distinction in the science and data between opening a restaurant and opening a movie theater that just happens to be a restaurant as well. In fact, what we've determined is that we're going to identify it going forward as a restaurant that just so happens to serve movies. So is this the beginning for Imagine Theater? By the way, I I I hope I'm not getting you in the middle of a big political mess here. We, we, you know, we want to be your friend, Paul. But is sure. this is this the beginning of leaving the theaters open? Is that what you plan to do with this event? And and you know, listen, I love your theaters. You got the great restaurants. We go in the most comfortable seating. It's so cool. We go into your theaters. That, you know, somebody brings us our food often when we're sitting there in the movie theater. I I love the movie experience you've created. But are you going to stay open at, given what you just said after this event on Friday? No, this is not a uh, this is not a statement of social disobedience. This is not uh, trying to put our thumb in the eye of government officials. This is really about doing good, and we're going to continue with the film festival uh, for as long as we think it, uh, it it can raise money for the intended cause. But at that point in time, we'll probably take a break again. Uh, until we're given the all clear sign. All right. Well, it's a great effort. And I appreciate it. You know, and we've seen this from every sector as they've opened slowly. It was, you know, the, the salons and the barbershops. And, you know, when they opened up medical offices, they felt that they should be open. When we had boating and sailboats could sail and power boats couldn't. We've we've had a continuing run through this whole uh, COVID-19 crisis where some people have, you know, been given the opportunity to open and others haven't. And there hasn't always been a lot of clarity as to why. Do you feel the movie theaters? I, I mean, you've already said it, but can you just it, restate it? The movie theaters are are, are are kind of a victim of that right now? Well, what I would tell you is that we've developed a 27 page reopening protocol. And I was the primary author of that uh, particular uh, guidelines. And, and so our trade association has embraced that. It includes an enormous number of uh, protocols that are designed to protect the public health. So it starts with our teammates. We'll be taking their temperature every day as they come in. They'll be filling out a health questionnaire all of our teammates will be wearing masks. We're instituting social distancing in the building. And then we're going, in addition, we're gonna have two vacant seats between every group of parties, unrelated parties. So the result is that we'll have seven feet in either direction to allow for folks to enjoy a social distancing, which is really what's required at this point in time. And so we don't think that we're being rebels in any way, shape or form. And again, we serve food, we serve drinks, much like restaurants do. Restaurants were open. And if, 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 if our government officials have science or data that would actually support our continued closure, then I think it's time for them to bring it forward. 
All right, Paul. Well, best of luck. By the way, congratulations on the Juneteenth Film Festival. We'll continue to promote it. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to do that. Great idea at the perfect time. And uh, and I can't wait to get out to Imagine Theater. I'm going to come out for the film festival. And I just can't wait till we get things back to normal. And uh, on a hot summer evening, get into the nice, cool, air-conditioned Imagine Theaters in our area and, and enjoy a movie in Birmingham or in in Royal Oak. So we look forward to that. Paul, how do people participate to, for, with the June, uh, Juneteenth Film Festival? They just come, do they buy tickets? Is there information online? What should we tell people? I would suggest that um, our guests go to imagine-entertainment.com. We have a whole lineup of films and the shows and showtimes are available. It's a great lineup of films and you can buy your tickets right on our website. All right. Paul, thank you very much. Thanks for taking time for us today. I know you're busy with uh, with everything going on, but I appreciate you taking a couple of minutes. Paul Glantz, very good to have you with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Dave. All right. So there you go, Tyler. Let's head to the movies. So we can at least yeah. go to the film festival this weekend and uh, head off to Royal Oak. And I, I really hope that uh, all of you watching and listening will take an opportunity to do the same. And, you know, I feel for Paul in the movie theaters, just like, you know, we, we felt for the barber shops and the hairdressers and the restaurants before them and all these different areas of our economy that it's just difficult to make logic over what's opening and what isn't opening. I would agree, and I, and I like the approach that Paul Glantz and his team at, at Imagine Theaters are, Entertainment are, are taking with, with this. It's an act of defiance in a way, like the Owasso Barber, but it's a different kind of defiance where it's calculated and it's temporary, showing, hey, we can do this for a good cause and, sh and at the same time show that we're able to open our facilities and reopen our business that's not permitted to be reopened yet and show that we can do it in a safe manner, while at the same time raising awareness for something that needs to be raised awareness for uh, without breaking the rules for an extended period of time. Yeah, and, and he's trying to do it in a nice way. Exactly. I mean, it, you know, the Owasso Barber was like, hey, hey I'm going to do this, screw you, right? And right. I don't think, and I, you know, and I get that, okay? I'm not passing any judgment on the Owasso Barber. But, you know, Paul's trying to do this, you know, with a charitable opportunity, and it's given him an opportunity to say his piece. And, you know, I think a lot of people agree with him. And, and uh, you know, it's, I think it's, he's, a, he's a very smart business person. And, you know, who's going to shut him down in the middle of this activity? That would be crazy. So uh, well done, Paul. I'm, I'm not surprised yes. that you came up with a great strategy to make your point and anything we can do, and, and we will. We'll get out and get to the film festival. Quick break, and then we're going to learn all about the Toad Opener, a new product that is going to keep you safer during COVID-19 when we return right here on the Megacast. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards. Back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart. Keep wearing a mask in public. And if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. Apologies for those technical difficulties. I'm Tyler Keith. Hey, Tyler, are we okay? We are okay now, yes, Dave. Okay. We'll, we'll so, hold strong uh, I, and hope it, it, it continues on strong. <laughs> okay. So I don't know where we left it off, but we are uh, we are right now with Nick Moritz, co-founder of Toad Opener. And uh, Nick was just telling us how this works. Essentially, it's a door opener. You don't need to touch with your hands. You open it up with your foot. So, Nick, uh, go back to telling us how this works. Yeah, so we prep. Uh, we have a door right here. We've got a sign that goes at eye level um, that's letting people know that it's there. And it is so easy to use because... All these public doors you see are all ADA compliant. So the amount of pressure needed to pull open that door is always less than five pounds. And so once you notice it, it's 
extremely uh, easy to use, and you just might have to adjust your foot the first time you ever take a look at it, but um, it couldn't be simpler. No, it's a really good idea. I, I love it, and congratulations on coming up with something innovative, and uh, good to hear you're using a 3D printer to make it. I just saw news today that even the automotive companies were using 3D printers to make components for some of the uh, ventilators that we're using. So it's it's a really great tool to use when you're trying to manufacture something, get it out to the market quickly. Um, so uh, further innovation in your innovation. So uh, Toad, how did you come up with the name Toad Opener? Well, because uh, we wanted to play on words, and um, we noticed that all the big brands seem to have some sort of animal mascot. We've got emus and geckos and uh, everything else. And so um, my father, actually, uh, uh, we call him Big P. Shout out to him. He, uh, he helped me out with this uh, from the beginning, and uh, it just occurred to him one day. He said, I got it. This is what you should call it. And uh, the rest is history. And it's got to also be nice, in addition to not having to use our hands to open doors and help stop the spread of COVID-19, it's nice when you have your hands full, too. Right. I mean, we just, uh, I don't think they'll mind, uh, put it in the uh, Royal Parkview Hotel in Rochester, and um, we put it on the restaurant, uh, the facing, but then also for the staff who are carrying, <laughs> you know, large uh, things from the kitchen, um, that they said immediately they said oh well why didn't we always have this thing here gosh <laughs> um so yeah i mean and and again putting it on uh, refrigerated doors um in the office i think that's going to be a, a no-brainer um when we when we start to uh, reopen up so nick your business is in royal oak and uh, clearly you've you've started to promote this around oakland county and so we're so happy to have you on the show today uh what are your aspirations for this product well, we, uh, we think that there's a um, pretty much an endless sea of doors out there, and um, we, uh, we want to partner with, um, with big groups, with uh, independent contractors who want to be the person uh, locally, nationwide, who uh, wants to put the, you know, wants to go ahead and put them in. And so we have a uh, installer program and we have uh, special pricing for, uh, for guys who say, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a contractor in, uh, in North Carolina. I've, I know uh, the, you know, a hundred bars or restaurants or movie theaters like your previous guest. Um, and I think I can help put them in and uh, we're happy to do it. All right, Nick. Listen, I got to run. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much for your time today. Great product. We'll have you back on the air. Keep in touch with us. Let us know how it's going. And uh, and I'm I can't wait to get out in Royal Oak this week. I'm going to go look around and and I bet I run into a toad opener or two, a new device that you can add to your door to get the door open without having to use your hands. Genius work, Todd. If people want to get a hold of me, how do they do so? Um, you can go to www.toadopener.com, T-O-A-D, and check us out on facebook.com slash toadopener. And actually, I'll announce we're, uh, we're going to launch a contest to name our two toads. We've got a lady toad here and a male toad. And we would like your help to figure out what uh, they should be named. So uh, check out our Facebook uh, account and vote. All right. Very good. Appreciate it, Nick. Sorry, I got to go. We'll talk to you again real no soon. No problem. Bye-bye. All right. Nick Moritz, the co-founder of Toad. I love it. Toad Opener. Tyler, let's add Toad Opener to the COVID-19 vocabulary. Oh, we will. We'll add it right away, Dave. All right. I got to scoot. Let's go to break. This is the Megacast. Tyler, we'll be right back. Coronavirus has put us to the test. Now it's time to put it to the test. We've greatly expanded testing in Michigan. So people who think they may have COVID-19 with symptoms like fever, cough, and shortness of breath can get tested. And those without symptoms who work in public can now get tested, as they could carry the virus. Start by calling your healthcare provider or contacting a testing site near you. Learn more at michigan.gov slash coronavirus test. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast, the second half of our show today. 
11 o'clock hour, it's all me, Tyler Keefe, here in our studios out of West Bloomfield. Dave Scott out on assignment for the remaining half of the show today, getting the scoop on everything we'll need to know for next week's program. And uh, he'll return with me on Monday and then with Ronnie Dahl and I on Tuesday. It's going to be a great next week for us here at the Megacast, and we hope that you'll continue to join us through all that. If you know, I had some technical difficulties today with some with the zoom stuff in the first hour of the show and that happens you know internet goes out and we're all doing stuff virtually today and technology isn't always on our side but we thank you for sticking with us bearing with us through all of that and hope that you'll enjoy the second half of our program today we have a lot of interesting people coming up to talk to nate adams detroit film from the detroit film critics society and the only critic.com will join me in a few minutes and then to cap off the show today, we will talk with DeWitt Dykes, an associate professor, professor at Oakland, Oakland University's Department of History. There's a lot of historical context to what's going on right now in the United States with the Black Lives Matter movement, with uh, pushing for police reform, with taking down statues of questionable historical uh, figures that have been made monuments in different cities throughout the United States, in the South, but also in Part in key cities on our east coast and our in our original colonies and even in places as close as Detroit where recently the Christopher Columbus statue wa was uh, going to be taken down uh, due to that of course murky history with uh, rela relation to Christopher Columbus great resources that we have for you for all your news making news today let's just go through our coronavirus news right now making our top headlines today uh, this is all available to you at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Yesterday, Governor Whitmer at a press conference was able to show an amazing graph that showed Michigan, and New, Michigan, New York, and New Jersey as, one of, as the three states that are quote-unquote on track to contain COVID-19. Michigan, alongside New York and New Jersey, have a low COVID risk level at this point in time and are, and are on track to contain the virus. COVID Act now, group, now is a group of technologists, epidemiologists, health experts, and public policy leaders helping to identify each state's risk level for the spread of the virus. Michigan, New York, and New Jersey are the only states on track to contain COVID-19. Other states are at risk or are in a, a state of a potential second outbreak as it's currently standing. The Michigan legislature approves $880 million in pandemic spending. The legislature unanimously approved the spending in a federal relief aid of spending of federal relief aid, my apologies, related to the coronavirus pandemic. The, fen the funding is to be used for frontline workers, municipalities, and child care providers. Governor Gretchen Whitmer is set to sign it and says, quote, this bill is an example of what can happen when politics are put aside and all parties come together to do what is best for the people of Michigan, including our frontline workers in local communities across the state, and closed quote. Additionally, 3D printing has helped GM, General Motors, make products for, quote, the arsenal of health. General Motors capitalized heavily on the use of 3D printers to build this arsenal. Most of the tools used to assemble the ventilators that GM is manufacturing with Ventec and Hamilton Medical have been 3D printed. General Motors Director of, Ad of Additive Manufacturing, Ron Dahl, says, we are, quote, we are able to, ver to very quickly use our capability here to pivot from what we use as automotive tools and apply it to medical devices. General Motors created two facilities for 3D printing technology in Warren during the virus. And construction for 2020 is on track, is on track despite coronavirus delays. That story and more, you can find that in updated news every single day on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And also go to civiccentertv.com slash megacast where you can find all of our interviews and clips of the most important things our guests had to say in those interviews on our website on demand any time of the day. Clips and interviews such as as we're having now with our next guest, Nate Adams, who joins us on the Oakland County Megacast. Nate is, is a, is a Michigan-based online and print critic for film, theater, and television. He is a Rotten Tomatoes-approved critic. 
and has had reviews seen across across national platforms like MovieTickets.com. He was also nominated for Rookie Writer of the Year in 2018 by the Michigan Press Association for his entertainment coverage. Nate, welcome to the Oakland County Megacast. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here talking movies. Yeah, happy to have you with us. So movies have have had. And movie theaters, movie the movie going experience, and just film in general has had a major change undergone during this coronavirus pandemic. Much like other industries, talk about t- tell us a little bit about what the landscape of the filmmaking industry is at this moment in time, as theaters continue to be shut down and productions are still somewhat in flux in most places in the world. Well, we're kind of seeing um, a shift in the way that. Uh, consumers, you know, audiences are getting their content. Um, for example, you know, Netflix has been uh, a pioneer in the in the streaming game and getting movies into into households, you know, without having to travel to the theater. And um, you know, recently, uh, Universal Studios has um, uh, kind of undergone an experiment, if you would say, with premium video on demand. And so instead of um, their big pictures heading to theaters like they were originally planned, um, like you're seeing uh, The King of Staten Island uh, premiered last week at home. Um, and their big movie um, that caused a lot of ruckus uh, was Trolls World Tour, which originally was supposed to come out April 10th in the theaters. Um, and instead, they went straight to, uh, to streaming um, at home for a premium price. And they actually made quite a bit of money off it. And it, and it caused uh, the theaters to kind of sweat a little bit. Um, And I think that that is going to be a permanent change. You're going to start seeing um, smaller scale pictures head straight to streaming and at home viewing. um, And you're only going to see like the big Disney Fast and Furious pictures in the theater. Do you believe that that change in the status quo is going to give these smaller, more independent films or maybe the films that aren't expected to have as great acclaim or or Oscar buzz necessarily a better chance at at sustainability uh, in their premiere stage and ability to profit and spread their message uh, than the traditional theater method. Well, so that's where it gets interesting because so when a movie gets released into, into theaters, there's a percentage that the studio and the, the exhibition house gets. So the theaters and the studios agree to a percentage, um, you know, for the first couple of weeks. Whereas if a studio releases a film at home um, directly, like basically cutting out the middleman, the theaters, Um, they get a a heftier percentage of the profits. So um, a $100 million grocer on video on demand is going to make them a lot more money per se than um, than $100 million in theaters. That being said, um, that model isn't sustainable for bigger pictures like like the Fast and Furious movies, like the big budget Disney temples that cost upwards of $250 million. Those movies do need theaters to survive. So um, like last week, Netflix dropped a, a new Spike Lee film called *The Five Bloods*, and that is already garnering Oscar attention. And and because there is really nothing out in theaters right now, because you know a lot of theaters are closed, especially in, in Michigan, um, what happens is that that movie can now essentially dominate the conversation all summer because everybody has immediate access to it. So it, it all depends on a platform, you know. A lot of these studios do need those fall festival circuits to launch the smaller scale films, you know, the Sundance Film Festival, there's Toronto, Venice, Telluride, all those festivals are in the fall and right now they're up in limbo if they're going to happen. So these studios are going to have to get creative with how they're going to market their films in order to get, you know, awards prospects and build word of mouth. And consequently, with these larger scale films that have the bigger studios behind them and have the A-list actors and are already under critical acclaim when they enter the theaters, is that going to change that dynamic too as they're competing with these films that are going straight to digital and people are consuming them um, at a cheaper price necessarily than they would going to the theaters? Uh, They're able to see this at their own leisure. They're able to watch it multiple times over. Is that going to change the dynamic possibly going forward, at least in the interim, for these large-scale films that maybe we'll decide we'll release in theaters for those that want the theater experience, but also release digitally or, or uh, straight to digital in this case so that we can compete with these other films. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think it all depends on the, the star power package, right? So uh, there's, there's a lot of conversation, and long gone are the, are the days when um, somebody like, for example, Will Smith, he could open a film on his box office appeal alone, and that movie could open, like a movie like a romantic comedy, like say, for example, Hitch, uh, could open to $35, $40 million on its opening weekend. 
uh, that that just doesn't happen anymore. The only way Will Smith can open a movie is if he's headlining the Disney remake Aladdin, which turned out to be the biggest movie of his career. But that wasn't that was based on an, an existing IP. So um, there's a movie coming out next year or in a couple of years, uh, directed by Martin Scorsese, and it has um, Leonardo DiCaprio and it has Robert De Niro in it. And that's the kind of star power package that can maybe draw people to see a movie in theaters, a, an original adult-driven drama. You know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood last summer kind of bucked the trend, too, that an original movie can still open in a, in a very big blockbuster environment. Um, but you're already seeing two big stars, you know, um, Ryan Reynolds, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, uh, big directors like Michael Bay, as I mentioned, Spike Lee. They're already kind of jumping on the streaming bandwagon because they can – they can make a movie for those companies without the fear of it bombing at the box office or bad word of mouth tarnishing um, the theatrical reputation. So um, I I do think that in the long run, you will start seeing more of these bigger stars kind of re re relegate to streaming. But uh, I wouldn't count out um, Dwayne Johnson also opening like a big budget film in theaters too. I think maybe they can coexist. And on that note, with, with the competition change, the dynamics of film, at least major Hollywood film, is definitely changing with this coronavirus pandemic, with the theaters being closed, with productions being shut down, but also with the other events that are going on in our society at this time, in particular the Black Lives Matter movement. There's been issues in the past, particularly with the awards, um, all of them, the, from television and from film. Um, in the past several years, we've seen the hashtag Oscars so white year and year again. It's, it's the current movement that we're seeing in the United States and the passion behind the Black Lives Matter movement and and uh, developing more equity in our society in general. Is that going to also translate over to reviewing films from a critical standpoint and from an awards standpoint and also to making films to, ha to be more inclusive? Well, um, this week, um, the Academy Awards actually just announced a, a big overhaul um, in their diversity initiative, um, they actually, uh, a very prominent filmmaker, Ava DuVernay, who made um, such films like Selma, she has a great documentary on Netflix right now called 13. She made the limited series When They See Us. You know, mm -hmm. She was just one of, 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 of a few uh, prominent um, filmmakers that were promoted to the Board of Governors in the, in the Academy Awards. Uh, and so I think that you, you're gonna you're gonna see things like that that are a step in the right direction. You're wondering how how things like this haven't haven't happened sooner. But at right. the same time, um, a filmmaker like Spike Lee, you know, who was a pioneer um, for African American filmmakers, you know, who made Do the Right Thing, um, Malcolm X, you know, he has a he has a great great career. He had the biggest hit um, with Black Klansman a couple years ago, which he won an Oscar for best uh, original screenplay. You know, first time he's won an Oscar. And the movie was a hit, made $100 million worldwide. He couldn't get The Five Bloods made anywhere else except for Netflix. Now, I'm not saying that's because of the, of the, of the subject matter of the film. I'm also saying it has to do a lot with the commercial viability of, of films in, you know, we talk about streaming and theatrical. Um, but I, I do think that you're going to start seeing more of this, too. And, and people like Ryan Murphy, who, who makes a television series for Netflix, you know, they make it stipulations in their clauses that... Um, a lot of representation needs to be on the set, so that way it's a more balanced, uh, balanced discussion happening. So I, I do think that um, we're going to see the impact of this movement um, ripple through a lot of the Hollywood industry, and it's and it's for the best. Too. It's a, it's a good it thing is. that it's happening. It absolutely is. And uh, I mean, I, I worked on film sets in, in college. I've worked on film sets after college as well. And you know, there, there's a ton of talented people that just are not getting their, fa their fair shot because of the color of their skin or, that, or it's definitely not helping them go further and they have to work extra harder. So seeing that equity be be put as a priority by the Academy and by film by big filmmakers throughout the country is something that should have happened, as you said, a while ago. It shouldn't have taken this long. And if it is happening now, it's, it's very good to hear. Um, similarly, in the Detroit area, uh, tomorrow, we just talked with Paul Glantz, the uh, chairperson of Imagine Entertainment. Imagine Entertainment at their Royal Oak location is going to be screening a Juneteenth film festival on Friday this week, despite theaters being restricted to stay closed. Uh, you are also familiar with the Detroit market, with the Detroit film, film, uh, film market here as well, and, and you understand the passion of the fans in this local area. What is the buzz you're yes. hearing from the fan standpoint, from the media standpoint, and even from other local theaters and, and 
uh, movie enthusiasts regarding the Juneteenth Film Festival at Imagine Theaters? Well, you know, it's it's a great thing what Imagine is doing, um, curating this lineup of, of films made by African-American filmmakers, you know, speaking to, to that medium. And because a lot of I, I they're selling tickets and all the proceeds are going to the United Negro Fund. You know, it's getting it's getting spread out to organizations that are, are very, very deserving. And so in that regard, it's it's a good thing. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, there's no negative buzz about that because it's all it's all good. It's all for a good cause. You know, but the other thing is, right, theaters are still closed. And I still hear murmurs that a lot of people don't feel comfortable going and sitting in an enclosed space. You know, especially when you get your popcorn, you get your drink, and you got you know wearing a mask. You know, it's it's kind of awkward. So I think the the job on on the theaters in order to build up that enthusiasm and momentum and get people back in the theaters, they really gotta market to the audience how how safe and sanitary the environment's going to be. And and and, and Paul Glantz has been very very outspoken about the procedures uh, of what Imagine is doing to make sure that the environment is safe. And sanitary, you know, they're leaving staggered times in between screenings to, to deep clean um, theaters. And I think that's very important that if, if, if a lot of theaters follow that example of what Imagine is doing and they see how well tomorrow goes with this Juneteenth Film Festival, which I think will have a, will have a good turnout if uh, the word on the street is, any, is of any indication. And I think that if, if we see that, that that is successful, you know, maybe... Um, people will be more than willing to go back in, into theaters. Granted, there's not new movies coming out until right now, July 24th with Mulan. Um, but I think that are gonna theaters are gonna rely on back catalog titles like you know your Jaws, your Back to the Future to get people interested in the theaters. And tomorrow, I think is a good is a good experiment to see how willing um, patrons in Detroit and all around Michigan are going to be to go back into the theater. Uh, joined now, we're joined currently on the Oakland County Megacast by Nate Adams. He is from the Detroit Film Critics Society and also the only critic. Dot com and we've uh, we're talking to him about the straight to digital trend we've seen lately in filmmaking as theaters continue to be closed due to COVID-19. Also, the Juneteenth Film Festival to be held tomorrow in Royal Oak at the Imagine Theater. Uh, and then just before we let you go, a couple more minutes with you, Nate. Uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the some of the movies that are out there now or are coming uh, in in the uh, coming days, weeks, and months. Uh, first and foremost, Artemis Fowl being released by Di by Disney Plus. Uh, some some good and some bad being being heard about that. I is this a what's your review of Artemis Fowl? Is it good? Is it bad? Is this something that could break Disney Plus if it's one way or another for better or for worse? So I think Disney knew that this movie was a dud and they were just tired of pushing it around on the release schedule. This movie got bounced around, I think, three or four times. And I think they just looked at it and decided, well, we're just going to drop it on our streaming service, which was probably the best thing because I could not recommend to a soul to pay money <laughs> to see okay. that movie. Um, it's very, very bad. Uh, I, you know, and it's probably the worst thing I've seen in 2020. And 2020 has been very tumultuous, but um, watching Artemis Fowl um, kind of, uh, it, 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 it makes you question uh, watching movies for, for, for a living. I'm sorry to be so harsh. Um, yeah, it's not nice. very good. <laughs> well, on a more positive note, Nate, what are some <laughs> movies? You mentioned some earlier, like Mulan, but other films that are coming out in, in, the, uh, in the next few months or so down the pike that we should be keeping our eye on. Um, so right now, the big movie that everybody's keeping their keeping their fingers crossed that comes out is a new Christopher Nolan film called Tenet, which was supposed to be the the big unifier in getting people to go back into theaters. So Tenet was originally supposed to come out July seventeenth. Last week, Warner Brothers kind of pulled that plug. They pushed it to July thirty first. So they're still kind of uh, easing the waters, but. Anytime Christopher Nolan steps into the ring and he makes an original film, I mean, chances are it's going to be pretty magnificent. I mean, the last one he did, Dunkirk, he did the Dark Knight trilogy, Memento, Insomnia. I mean, the list goes on. If any filmmaker is guaranteed to bring in audiences and to get the theatrical experience going again, it's Christopher Nolan with Tenet. Um, and right now, that that's stated for July 31st. I think that's the, the, the big, big one. And then you got Quiet Place 2 in September. Um, you know, Top Gun Maverick's coming out in December. I mean, who knows if if these releases stay where they are, I mean, this is still a, a domino effect. Uh, we saw last week a bunch of releases shift around on the schedule. So um, as of right now, Tenet's still coming out July 31st. Fingers crossed it does if it's safe to do so. 
Nate Adams joining us from from the Detroit Film Critics Society and from theonlycritic.com. Nate, anything else you'd like to say before I let you go? Uh, just, uh, you know, wash your hands and wear a mask if you, if you do go out. Be safe, uh, respect your fellow neighbor, um, and, you know, um, just uh, support your communities too. Um, thank, thanks for having me. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for being on with us, Nate. We appreciate it. Nate Adams joining us today, a film critic from the Detroit Film Critics Society and theonlycritic.com. He is all, he's also a Rotten Tomatoes-approved critic and has had reviews seen across national platforms such as movietickets.com. I'm Tyler Keith. We'll be back shortly on the Oakland County Megacast. We have Erica Jones out in the field with us. She'll check in in just a moment, and then we'll talk to DeWitt Dykes from the Oakland University Department of History. Coming up after this short break, you are watching and listening to the Oakland County Megacast. Technology, like smartphones, are wonderful devices to reduce social isolation in older adults. You can call grandchildren, phone friends, participate in fitness classes, and play games. But you need to stay mindful of scams. Scams related to the COVID-19 virus are rising. These include attempts to obtain personal information from seniors, including pitching unreliable products, advice, tests, and cures. You need to stay vigilant and be cautious. If you feel that you have been taken advantage of, it's okay for you to reach out to somebody you know and seek out advice, or even contact your medical provider. Thank you. Michigan, we still need to stay careful because we don't want to go backwards, back to where we started. So keep standing six feet apart, keep wearing a mask in public, and if you have symptoms, talk to a healthcare provider about getting tested. To move forward, let's all do our part. So stay careful. Michigan.gov slash coronavirus. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith, and uh, we got a lot still going on here in this in the last half hour or so of our show. Thank you for joining us on 89.3 Lakes FM, on 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, on WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio, and on our video outlets, Birmingham Area Municipal Access and Civic Center TV, both of those channels on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Channel 99, Civic Center TV also on civiccentertv.com. You can click on Watch Live and watch us anytime in full high definition. And you can also find all of our episodes, interviews, and clips from, to, from the Megacast on civiccentertv.com. Just click on Megacast. Also joined on Facebook, our Facebook partner today, is the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Thank you for joining us those of you watching on Wald Lake's Facebook page. We're joined now also in the field. Erica Jones is out at a, lo at a, local, uh, at a local business. Erica, where are you at? Hi, Tyler. I'm here at Frenchie's Modern Now Care on Orchard Lake Road in West Bloomfield with their owner, Lindsay, who you were actually lucky enough to have with us on the Megacast a little while back. And we talked with her then about the struggles of not being able to open. So now we get to see it on the flip side as she just reopened this morning for the first time at 10 a.m. So she's gonna talk with us a little bit about how that's been on this first day. Okay. So if I can flip my camera. So hi, Lindsay, thanks so much for talking with us. Hi. How's your first day going? It's good, you know, um, we have all five of our nail techs here and you know, we're jam picked busy today, but it's going, you know, we're trying to figure out the whole you know, making sure we're social distancing, working with masks, then working with gloves, you know, having people text to check in, but so far so good. So how does it feel to finally be open it again? Good. It feels really good. We actually had our first uh, day yesterday, but it was just us sort of getting together, which was nice. Hold on, let me turn yeah. this off. No uh, worries. There we go, sorry. Um, 
so it was nice to get everyone together. And it was like, we haven't been here in three months. However, it didn't seem like anything. It was nice. It was good. Got back in person. Thank you. My nails are done. So yay. Uh, so <laughs> are there any struggles that you faced this first day with the new uh, procedures in place? Well, what I mean, right away, we, we're going to learn things, right? It, instantly. Um, it, the first thing is a lot of times folks like to sit on the pedicure bench, right? And let their nails dry when their service is done. And it's like, oh, wait, we can't do that if we're full and we have, you know, we can only have we have eight, eight spots. We can only have four in use to, you know, adhere to the social distancing. So we're like, oh, good news is we have a waiting area that they can sit in. But just right away, we just sort of looked at each other like, she wants to sit there. Like, oh, what are we supposed to do? Um, but we're like, okay, figure it out as we go. So yeah. Good. Well, so definitely in a just from looking around, it seems like things are going well. If we can take a peek sure. inside yeah. and see all the action. So this is yeah. the nice setup that they have here as Lindsay showed us a little while back on the show. Their motto is, we love clean. So they have that sign up, very fitting during this time. And then, yeah, as you can see, not all of the chairs are filled, making sure that people are staying socially distanced and distanced. That's a family over there. That's why they're together. So yeah, it seems like things are going very well. You know, over here, they have their employees wearing gloves and really just making sure to stay clean and keeping everyone safe. What are some of those extra safety measures? We saw that earlier on in the week at other facilities we, we visited that are being put in place. Any sort of barriers or um, social distancing measure, measures on the floor and things like that. Anything else in place um, that you're seeing, Erica? You know, not quite. Not necessarily barriers because they have a pretty good system going, like I said, where, you know, they're just blocking off certain tables or right here, actually, they have a sign that just says this station is full. Sorry about that. It says this station is closed to allow for social distancing. Um, and then, yeah, actually they do have the um, plastic things right here to make sure that there's a wall. So yeah, they do have some extra stuff going on. That's not like, oh. if people want it to feel more safe. Yeah, so people, they have these, they're portable. So they have these here if people want to feel more safe. So they're being very accommodating to their customers and making sure that everyone is accommodated. Well, that's good to hear. Good to see Erica. Anything else from out in the field at Frenchie's Modern Nail Care in West Bloomfield? Erica, anything else? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that, Tyler. I'll just ask if you have anything else, uh, anything else to report oh. from out in the field. Um, you know, I think that pretty much covers it. Lindsay, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about your reopening? No, we just hope, you know, it, it goes smooth and, you know, our loyal uh, client base is coming back and we have new guests too. And we hope to keep doing that and proving, you know, how clean we are and how we'll take care of everyone. All right. Well, awesome. Great to hear it. And yeah, that is the story from Frenchie's Modern Now Care in West Bloomfield. So back to you, Tyler. Thank you very much, Erica. Erica Jones out in the field for us today in our in our Oakland County community, giving us a report on some of those businesses that did reopen this week, those salons, those barber shops, and, and so on, personal care services that were permitted beginning Monday to reopen. And some of them waited, some of them didn't, and a lot of them have different have varying and different approaches to reopening their business in a safe and healthy manner, keeping COVID-19 in mind. We're going to take another short break, and when I return, I'll be speaking with, the, with an associate professor from the Oakland University Department of History. Get a historical context on the movement that we're seeing in Oakland County, in the state of Michigan, and all throughout the United States to hopefully provide some more equity in our society that's long overdue. I'm Tyler Kieft. We'll be back shortly on the Oakland County Megacast. Michigan. We're calling on you to save lives. Don't ignore it. Don't let it go to voicemail. It's urgent. In fact, it's critical. Because if you've been in close contact with someone who tests positive for COVID-19, you may have been exposed to the virus. And you could get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department. So please answer the call to learn how to protect yourself, your family, and friends. We're calling on you to stop the spread of COVID-19, to make it safe to reopen businesses and help Michigan move forward. So if you get a call from My COVID Help or your local health department, you may have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. To protect us all, answer the call. 
Learn more at michigan.gov slash contain COVID. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back to the Oakland County Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe. Thank you for watching us on Civic Center TV and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, as well as the Facebook page of the Wald Lake Consolidated School District. Thank you for being our Facebook partner today. And also for listening to us on 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff in Bloomfield Hills and in the Auburn Hills area, WAHS 89.5. Avondale Community Radio, this making up the Oakland County Megacast. Mega and just a few more minutes left in our show. Not a whole lot left left in today's edition of the Megacast, and we will be back tomorrow as well from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. And you can watch this full episode if you're just tuning in and you want to watch the entire thing, you can watch it later on tonight on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Click on full episodes and it will be right there. You'll see all of our very important interviews, including our next interview where I'll be speaking with associate professor from the Oakland University Department of History. His name is DeWitt Dykes, and he joins us now in the Oakland County Megacast. Mr. Dykes, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. How are you? How's your how's your team over at Oakland? Say that again. How are you? How's your how are your team over at Oakland doing? Well, we're all doing well. We're in uh, exile, or or shit. There's uh, another word for it. In uh, what? Isolation. Isolation. Yes. Yes. Well, well, it's good to hear that you're doing all right. Uh, we we're living in some very historic times right now. A lot of important moments going on that we're going to be learning from in the future and hopefully that we can get through by learning from our past as well in particular i think the most one of the most profound if not the most profound historical moment that we're currently going through is the black lives matter movement is is really hitting its stride right now and i think it's starting to generally with, with the masses here in the united states take hold and people are taking the messages seriously um, you were also involved in the civil rights movement and the marches of the 1960s. In what ways do you see a comparison or a, and some contrasts between the civil rights movement of the 1960s and the Black Lives Matter movement of our modern days? Well, they are similar in that the Black Lives Movement as well as the civil rights movement each addressed what was considered to be a major problem of the time, and it employed a method of trying to publicize and attack it and try to dismantle the problem and improve the situation for that time. And each had some success according to what happened. Uh, and what many people don't realize is that the civil rights movement, as they call it, uh, went on from the early 1900s down to uh, the 1970 at least, for example. And it had small victories, small changes, uh, over periods of time, and so the Black Lives Movement is having the same thing. When it first uh, came out and started using that slogan, people didn't understand it. Uh, at least many people didn't. Many Black people did, uh, but many whites used the phrase, oh, all lives matter, but they didn't understand the distinction, and so the George Floyd case, several other cases we could numerate, et cetera, have now given it a new life, but especially also the uh, Eman the murders at the Emanuel AME T uh, Church in uh, in Charleston, South Carolina. That played a very significant role. Totally unprovoked assault on African Americans to start what the man thought was going to be quote a race war, and so that plus the George Floyd and many other uh, problems when the African Americans have been unjustly attacked and et cetera, have given the Black Lives Movement a, um, a new lease and a new vision. And so even many whites now are using uh, the symbols and the signs of Black Lives Matter to help publicize the desire for some degree of equality, a much greater degree. And, and on that note, the, the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, as it's, as it's being referred to in today's times, and just the phrase Black Lives Matter, you alluded to 
at, at first when it was first being used several years ago that the reaction from the white community from or, from or at least a significant portion of white people that responded to that saying all lives matter and there is a difference in that because black lives matter isn't simply saying that that black lives matter more than any other life it's saying that they matter in general and and that there are inequities in this society that need to be addressed to take that to heart and when people are saying all lives matter they're not only taking away from that argument they're actually making a counter argument that's really unproductive from a historical standpoint what is the significance negatively of all lives matter of the all lives matter mantra countering black lives matter and and what positive changes that are necessary in the society that the movement is trying to make well basically it's a refusal to see the uniqueness of what happens to blacks on a very routine situation. Uh, the George Floyd situation, the situation in Atlanta that s came right after it. It's almost as if the police in Atlanta never heard of George Floyd, never heard of what happened, uh, and didn't ha hear about what happened in South Carolina, about a man who was shot six times because he was trying to run away after being stopped for a broken taillight. So, what Black Lives Matter and other similar kinds of things are trying to say is Blacks don't receive a degree of respect as human beings that they ought to receive. It's that simple. And that it's different. Uh, occasionally, a white person gets badly treated, such as the white man, I think, in Buffalo, New York, who was knocked down, but they didn't kill him. Not that that has to be done but he was disrespected and mistreated for no reason whatsoever. And it does happen to some whites, but it happens more routinely to blacks. It and does. Usually with, right. usually with no um, remedies or no, or no remedies or very little punishment. It does, and, and, it, and the evidence shows that, the statistics show that, and, hi and history shows that as well. And, and that's what this movement is partially fighting for is to obviously make that tragic outcome that happens so continuously in our society be done away with and be more equitable but uh, it's also to reorganize the and, and and to rethink the way that we approach law enforcement and um, policing our communities and we've seen a lot of uh, arguments being made to defund the police and a lot of arguments being made to reform the police and those arguments have validity uh, because of historical significance of the police in a lot of these black communities. Can you touch on that a little bit about the differences historically that we have seen in policing of predominantly black communities versus predominantly white communities? Well, until recently in large cities, even medium-sized cities and others where there were large numbers of blacks and whites, uh, most blacks looked upon the police as a kind of occupying army. And now that police have won throughout the nation the right not to have to live in the places where they work, them even more of an occupying army, a group of people who come into work and to beat them up, uh, to mistreat them, to assume that any accusation is a serious uh, crime that they've committed and that any black skin is something that has to be investigated, uh, for example. And so many blacks still look upon them as an occupying army and realize that even though there are many individual officers in many circumstances where they do good, occasionally you hear about a officer who helps to deliver a baby of a woman who's on her way to the hospital or, or some other uh, save a life or somewhat other. And occasionally in the community policing, some people, some officers are friendly and um, make and use their connections with the, with the community to help solve crimes. But too often we keep hearing about situations where officers get confused and they're called to see if someone's all right and wind up treating the person as if they are a uh, robbery or uh, burglary system killing them. And so that happens too often and it's very unfortunate. Uh, I heard you or someone mention the the, um, <clears throat> the the uh, the the uh, Juneteenth celebration that's coming up this yes. weekend, and the 
observers at the theaters, uh, I think a lot of people don't fully understand about either the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment and the circumstances under which the slaves became free. And uh, greater recognition of Juneteenth is, is one of the things that can help improve race relations. Unfortunately, a lot of white people think, well, slavery was a long time ago. I didn't have anything to do with it. And in many cases, my family had nothing to do with it. And so there's no need to think about it. But it is a situation in which, first of all, uh, almost 4 million people were still enslaved when the Civil War started, almost 4 million. Of those people, most of them were born in the United States of America after the slave trade was cut off in the early 1800s. And many, of, many whites in general thought that the Africans were inferior. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, as president, about 1915, referred to uh, a host, H-O-S-T, of dusky children put out of school too soon. And what he meant by that is somehow slavery was supposed to be civilizing these Africans and making them better human beings, and that it ended too soon. And this, of course, is roughly, uh, what is it, 40, 45 and 60 years after slavery was over. He's saying they were put out of school too soon. And so that attitude that Africans in general are inferior, uh, persons of African descent are inferior, has come down to the present time in various ways. It's much more subtle as opposed to as open as it was uh, under the Woodrow Wilson administration. But we still have the assumption of inferiority. Low income status is considered a form of inferiority. And there's assumption that if African Americans were equal to whites, they'd work hard and become economically equal to whites. So uh, anyway, we have these things and many people don't understand the significance of the Emancipation Proclamation that it didn't free all the slaves and it didn't cover all of the states where slavery uh, was legal. So the Juneteenth celebration that's coming up this weekend is a celebration to observe the final and ultimate end of slavery. Uh, the 13th Amendment is what finally made slavery totally illegal uh, throughout the country as an institution and a practice. Of course, uh, some slave owners tried to keep uh, the slaves there as long as possible. Uh, and the um, the most important thing that could help African Americans and low income people in general is to improve the economy so there are better jobs, better health care, better pensions, etc. It's terrible that the coronavirus has made low income people and people dependent upon working every day virtually. In, in greater poverty than they were before, mm -hmm. that they have few jobs and few little income and no, uh, no backup. And it's terrible that the national government has not increased the, uh, the opportunity for low income people to enroll in some form of health care. Instead, they are so committed to getting rid of health care for working class and low income people that they have just refused and act as if it's their problem, so to speak. So we need to have a better economy. Uh, we need to have more benefits, health care, uh, pensions, uh, unemployment insurance. We need to have that for all persons at every level, regardless of their job. We need it for not only people who have steady work in normal times, but people who uh, have uh, part-time work and who are trying to raise families and persons who uh, have what sometimes people call gig work, who work by the job as opposed to having a steady stream of income. So we need a, we need a lot of improvements. We're joined by DeWitt Dykes, Associate Professor of, of uh, 
at the Oakland <laughs> University Department of History. My apologies for this. I stumbled a little bit. DeWitt right. Dykes, Associate Professor at the Oakland University Department of History with us on the Oakland County Megacast and ma making great points uh, about the abolition of slavery and the true abolition of slavery because the Emancipation Proclamation was a stopgap. And historically speaking, with the context behind it, Abraham Lincoln didn't entirely want to free enslaved people. It was a strategy to, that significantly helped the Union Army win the Civil War. And the 13th Amendment took away the allowance of slavery, of slavery and did legally abolish slavery, but didn't take away those contextual and continuous systemic racism uh, points of systemic racism in our society that still exists today, and that's what we're seeing in this context today of the Black Lives Matter movement. And with that being said, uh, Professor Dykes, the communication is definitely d in place. We're seeing oftentimes the uh, powers that be, whether it be municipal leadership, whether it be law enforcement leadership, or it be state and federal leadership communicating with leadership in the protests and in the movement, opening up conversations, considering different changes. Are you seeing better progress? Are we seeing better progress right now than we have in the past when we've had incidents occur, tragedies occur, and protests begin similar to the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020? Is it having a greater effect now and is more positive change coming from this current iteration of the movement and this current momentum better yet of the movement than in the past well temporarily at the present time we have greater public attention unfortunately the video showing uh, uh, George Floyd with the policeman on his neck is saying I can't breathe the other policemen on his back are watching and doing nothing to try to make sure he lived so he could go to jail and find out if he really is guilty of some sort of a crime. But they killed him without any effort to determine if he was really guilty. He was accused, but never proven guilty. And the video makes it so clear. Now, uh, Eric Garner in uh, New York was killed in a similar fashion, and there was some video but it didn't seem to arouse the same kind of public attention and persistence. And so um, we hope that this will be a longer term concern and a broader examination of social relationships and a greater desire to get something done on a broader scale. The degree to which it persists, that is the interest in making changes Right now, they're considering more changes other than trying to make police just a better group of people, but trying to realize that there's some cases where you need social workers or other kinds of persons with other skills. And you might even need to hire some social workers to be policemen to send them out at certain times or persons with those skills. Unfortunately, uh, the police are usually hired for combat uh, and former Army people and other uh, armed forces people are often hired for, for that, for example. And then, uh, and many of them have been trained to be combat warriors in some place like Iraq or some other place overseas. So instead of, they have trouble looking upon their fellow citizens as per persons who need to be considered uh, with some degree of, of, of politeness, concern, and try to make sure there's a real reason. And then if you watch the indictment of the police in Atlanta, they did not tell Mr. Uh, I forget his name right now. They did not tell him he was under arrest. Mm -hmm. They did not even say you're under arrest. And he cooperated with them for many, 40 minutes or more. And then when they tried to physically restrain him, he resisted. And whether he should have not is not the issue. They never said, you are under arrest, put your hands behind your back. That's what they should have said. They never did. Training. And, so they're yeah, and, and training and reform is hopefully going to, in, in part, 
address that, but th there's a greater issue at hand that, that is what this movement is pushing to raise awareness for and to make change for. DeWitt Dykes, associate professor at the Oakland University Department of History. Just a couple more minutes with you, and I'd just like to ask you about this as well. We've seen a lot of calls to take down statues, to remove names from institutions of historical figures that have very murky or, or frankly, inhumane <laughs> pasts uh, throughout our country. And it's making some momentum. We're seeing statues all throughout the world, really, being taken down, including a Christopher Columbus statue in, De in Detroit as well in recent times. Some would argue that's erasing history. I, I'm not in that camp, and I, I, I still see the historical significance of those figures, regardless of if there's a statue or not, or if their name's on a wall. Is removing these statues removing their history, or is it putting their history in a different context that's more productive with what we know today? You said it beautifully. It's not removing history, but putting it in a better context. And statues belong in museums, perhaps in some other places, uh, but the places they've been put in is to give them honor. And we need to give them less honor and to evaluate their actual role in history and we have statues to people who helped decimate the Native Americans, for example. Uh, and whether we should have such a statue is a question. It might be that we need a little more analysis, but, but persons who are associated with uh, decimating the Native Americans with racial segregation, with, racial, with slavery, et cetera, et cetera, then uh, we don't need to memorialize these people as opposed to, uh, we have history books, we have other places, and in places like Virginia, they do have a, a Museum of the Confederacy. And there's nothing wrong with having a Museum of the Confederacy to show how wrong they were and what, how, how, how uh, organized they were and their attitudes. But what we do need to do is to get rid of this idea that the Confederates uh, weren't trying to preserve slavery because that was the primary thing they were trying to do. Right. But some people don't seem to realize that the Confederate flag equals dedication to keeping people in slavery. The Confederate flag means a dedication to keeping people in slavery and to rebelling against civility and treating other people with equality. That's what the Confederate flag is. And then you have all sorts of monuments uh, and the community should agree on which monuments to keep and which ones to get rid of. And what the monuments don't have to be totally destroyed, but put in a different place where they, their significance of the person involved can be accepted. And just like museums have, have uh, and art museums especially, have a wide variety of items in their collection, they can be kept and be observed and be taught. This is what some people used to memorialize and idealize and, and et cetera, but we don't do that anymore. And this is why. And so they can be used for teaching, but get them out of places where uh, it appears that they're trying to say whatever they did was wonderful. They kept people in slavery. They hounded the Native Americans. They killed and decimated Native Americans. They took their land, et cetera, et cetera. It says if all that's fine. Well, thank you very much for being with us today, Prof Associate Professor DeWitt Dykes from Oakland University's Department of History. I appreciate you being with me today. All right, and hope you have a uh, happy Juneteenth this weekend. You as well. Thank you very much, Professor. Associate Professor DeWitt Dykes from Oakland University's Department of History with us on the Oakland County Megacast. And just about two minutes left before I have to say goodbye today. And what I take is really interesting from the last couple minutes of my interview there with, with Mr. Dykes is the purpose of history is in this. And it's in what we spoke about as well. The purpose of history isn't to record what's going on necessarily. It's to record what's going on so that we can learn from it and we can absorb it and we can understand what happened, how it happened, and why it happened and change and learn and grow as a society and as people. Because if we don't understand the contexts behind these events, we're not gonna understand how they were right, how they were wrong, and what we can do differently. And I think that what I'm seeing as, a, as one of the great positives of the Black Lives Move Matter movement in today's context, in 2020, and what we're seeing 
in the, in the media and what we're seeing in conversations in the community, human to human, is we're seeing that context of history, that purpose of history be put into action in some way, in some form. It's a slow process, and that's going to happen. Uh, it takes a lot to knock some of those ways that we've learned how to learn out of our minds and rethink things. But we're making progress. We're having those conversations, and we're recognizing what we've done wrong. We're recognizing what others have done wrong and working to correct them. And I think that's the best that we can, that we can do to start the process. It doesn't change things. It doesn't make things better. And it doesn't change history. But it allows us to take the context of that history with what we know, with what we believe, and with what we hope for to make a better world and create a better world. And hopefully, in the grand scheme of things, that's what happens. With about 30 seconds left in the show, thank you for joining us today. For Dave Scott, for Erica Jones, and our entire team, I'm Tyler Keep. A big thank you to all of our guests on the program today from the Wald Lake Consolidated School District, Ken Gutman. From Oakland University, Dwayne Baxa and DeWitt Dykes. As well as from Toad Opener, we had Nick Moritz. From the Detroit Film Critics Society, Nate Adams, as well on the program with us. We thank you for joining us today, and we'll be back tomorrow with more Oakland County Megacast.